Hello friends, I am the Dungeon Tutor and today I have a very special video. This is a long awaited video. I have wanted to do a video like this for a very long time. This is a video response. And video responses to me are the first leg in accomplishing the mission of what I have always wanted to do with videos. Having a dialogue with my viewers. Being able to talk about the issues that I care about and make videos of. And in this case, I got exactly what I wanted. And that's excellent. Uh, I have a response from my last conversational video, uh, which was entitled uh, Dungeon Tutor, no, uh, Dungeon Conversation, Dungeons and Dragons. And to that, I got a response from PGI Films, or PGI Films, whichever, capitalization is fun. And they put down a, a, a lengthy response to my video. Now, this particular video I did was a conversational tone talking about my experiences with Dungeons & Dragons from the very beginning when I started playing in this hobby to today. And I covered a wide swath from the basic edition, basic red box, from uh, the, the Back Me Dungeons and Dragons experience, to uh, first edition, AD&D, second edition, AD&D, third edition, 3.5, fourth edition, fifth edition. And, um, yeah, I, you know, people seem to like the video. It was a good video. But... Again, it generated this kind of a response. And because of the response is lengthy and I think fairly, fairly well thought out, I thought it might be ideal to respond. This will do two things. Number one, it continues the conversation. Number two, it shows folks that, hey, this is a guy who cares about our input too and will answer our questions and will respond to our thoughts on something creating these dialogue videos. So, I think it's very important and I am very eager to do this. So, I'm going to tuck right in and cover the response. So, <clears throat> bear with me, please. Uh, the time comment on this, uh, timestamps on comments often aren't all that useful, but if you're following along at home, uh, this, this kind of puts it about midway through after I've been talking at length about, again, what Dungeons & Dragons was like. But this is, this is useful. Uh, the quote, that was not in any of the books expressly. This is in response to my take, or lack of recollection, of the old way that we had of resolving, does this work or does this not, if it's not expressly in combat, which is what early versions of Dungeons & Dragons were ex exclusively concerned with. We often had the method of rolling a 20-sided die and trying to get under your attribute that is close to, most closely linked to what you're trying to do. This is in lieu of having any kind of skills because the earliest edition didn't really have skills in that method. So this was widely used. It was used by some of my earliest groups in uh, playing uh, first edition, AD&D. I have never seen a book expressly say this. It feels house rules -y, and I'll explain why in a, in a second, but first their comment. When playing Back Me in 1st Edition, when an existing proficiency from Oriental Adventures, Dungeoneer's Survival Guide, or Wilderness Survival Guide didn't fit, there was a proficiency system in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. There wasn't anything in Back Me or BX, but they were very broad, general background skills. And as likely to be completely useless to an adventurer as anything. You could have broad knowledge in farming, for instance. Not too often where that's going to come up in the course of adventuring. So they were, it was kind of like a vestigial, just kind of slapped in there. Hey, your character knows something else that would give them a day-to-day -day skill that they might have grown up into. Clearly, it's not what they chose to do with their life. They want to be adventurers. But it was there. So, you know, and, and that was expanded on in Unearthed Arcana and Oriental Adventures. So, yes. Uh, and also the Dungeoneer's Survival Guide, Wilderness Survival Guide, also had uh, sections on that that kind of, again, more detailed how those things might apply to uh, your experiences in a dungeon. But 
but I could never remember how and why we used it. Again, I absorbed it from other players. So, again, this could have been something widely house-ruled. Or, it may have been taken from a resource like an early Dragon magazine, perhaps. But I haven't myself yet found it. And I, even though I have the earliest of Dragon magazines on CD, um, I've never seen that. I, but I haven't looked in such detail that I might find it. If I do an absolute concrete directed analysis... If it's there, I'll find it. But I have not done that yet. Uh, so, uh, then I came across a video talking about the addition and evolution of thieves in Dungeons & Dragons, and it mentioned a rule in the BX game books titled, There's Always a Chance, that describes using a relevant stat for the situation and rolling under that stat to determine success. If that's the case, it may be that that is the first recorded representation of that rule, or possibly the only one. But, admittedly, even the BX books are in themselves an evolution of a lot of ideas. By this time, people had been pinballing ideas, not only between each other, but also bouncing it back up the chain to the folks at TSR. So if they incorporated that as a rule or a suggestion for Game Masters on how to adjudicate players' desires to do things outside of combat then, yeah, that, that could very well be that that came into circulation that way and then got more broadly distributed. I never saw one of the BX books with my friends who were playing first edition when I was back in high school, but they very easily could have been influenced by such a rule. So, and also, in uh, earliest groups that I was with, they used this rule without citing any references, but several groups used that same rule, so... I don't know where the commonality comes from. Uh, do, 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 do. So, I never had the BX books, only Beck Me. Uh, I have one, and I didn't see that rule in it, but I, I will have to look through it a lot more thoroughly. Now, I'm, now I know what to look for. Uh, though I can't remember it in the Beck, Beck Me basic books if they had that rule, I can only assume it did because we were using that rule for task and skill rules in our Beck Me game. I honestly have never seen that rule in there. And I've read the Game Masters, the, the Dungeon Masters Guide, multiple times. Um, and I don't ever recall seeing that suggestion, because it's just something that didn't get touched on. Like many things in Dungeons & Dragons, it was a hole in the rules that the, the Game Master filled in themselves. Now, I'm not saying that that doesn't exist. And I, I cannot... After having rifled through my memory, I can't remember seeing it, but I cannot say that it was never there. So, we will have to do a better analysis on that. But, uh, you have the same experience, apparently, as I did, which is kind of cool. I'm interested if other old-time old players and game masters had the same experience, so that's, that's interesting. Uh, so, later on, uh, timestamp uh, 4230... It is very much likely there was stuff like that in 2nd edition as well, especially with all of the kits. Okay, we talked about the evolution of Dungeons and Dragons through the 2nd edition of the uh, Player's Handbook. And again, the idea of changing the core of the rules as related to classes, because there were kits that more directly focused your character beyond just the core class, they would give them often new powers and abilities at the expense of some of the ones the class always had had. Uh, this allowed you to customize your character a little bit more fully, often because of the limited amount of playtesting, often allowed you to power game with some of the classes that just were functionally more powerful. But, uh, returning to this, kits added more distinguished flavors to characters but the difference between pre-second edition flavoring and second edition is that second edition kits provided a mechanical rule set where prior editions needed the DM to homebrew possible bonuses and penalties. Now maybe the person behind this comment is a lot more experienced in Game Masters homebrewing like crazy. I didn't have that experience. For us, the classes were pretty inviolate. You played the class that was as close to the character you wanted to play as possible, and that was it. 
I never asked anybody if I could have a fighter that could cast some minor magical spells. I never asked uh, if I could have a monk, but instead of one ability, I could have a different ability from something else. That never really came up. But we know that homebrewing it was extraordinarily popular in the early days of Dungeons & Dragons, and that the way some people ran the game were barely recognizable from looking at the book and reading through rules as written. So... That's fair. Kits did allow customization. They did allow more flavoring for what you were particularly interested in. In some cases, drastically so. Almost leaving very little of the core class, besides maybe the hit dice or maybe an ability or two, but after that, going off in completely different directions. And some people would, would say that just proves that Dungeons & Dragons was so beloved, people just wanted to add their own stamp to it and continue to have more and more choices and more and more flair, which leads us into the third edition, of, granted by Wizards of the Coast instead of TSR, but getting an almost incredible, almost overwhelming amount of choice. But I digress, going back. Uh, so, uh, DMs would do all of that stuff. Take, for example, a swashbuckler-type character in a nautical-themed adventure where the party had acquired a ship of their own and set out as privateers and pirates. How would this character be distinguished mechanically in a pre-second edition game without homebrewing? Well, I mean, earlier on, you could have the secondary character skills of uh, nautical, seamanship, navigator, whatever. Um... And that would basically allow you to do tasks without needing to roll, because you would know what to do. Um, was that satisfying? Well, not, not terribly. But then again, a lot of professions, a lot of professional jobs, while obviously useful in the setting of you know, the, the, the world, not as, not as important to an adventurer themselves. That's why I think the sailor uh, background in 5th edition D&D has less players using that background than any other one as far as I know. I've only had one character that I've ever come up across that had a sailor background. Unless you're doing a nautical themed adventure, there's not much point in it. So, continuing. Uh, yes. Uh, do, 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 do. In second edition, you simply adopted a kit and you got to stand out a bit from characters of the same class that didn't have the kit. Granted, several of the kits presented in the expanded 2nd edition splat books, like the, the Complete Fighter's Guide, etc., etc., uh, granted, several of those were unbalanced when compared to benefits granted by other kits, but no kit was actually overpowered with the ability to destroy actual game balance within this campaign by causing increasing power creep. I would disagree with that. <laughs> There's a couple of notorious kits uh, that, you know, wholesale just either ignored uh, or obliterated uh, disadvantages that some classes had as balancing issues uh, or took on all of the useful things of an entirely different class within them while keeping most of the benefits. Um, I Again, a little too far out to, to cite specific examples, but our little group, back when I played 2nd Edition, we had a couple that... Game Masters would be like, if you want this one, I'm really keeping an eye on you because this is almost power gaming. I think there was a kit for the Rangers. Now, the Rangers have not always been the strongest of classes and everything, but I believe they had one kit called the Justicar, which gave them paladin abilities along with being rangering abilities. I could be wrong in which, which class that was, but... That was one that was widely targeted as being rather uh, abusive in terms of what, they, what it took away as far as the abilities that it gave you. Um, I remember some kits that were also very annoying. I remember somebody taking a bard, Meister Singer, and a druid class. I, I can't remember what uh, kit they took. But basically, the Meister Singer was more of the uh, Pied Piper approach. They could play their musical instruments and ensnare animals so that they would have a whole following. Uh, and then the druid also got in on that too, so they had an entire zoo following them around, which ground combats down to a halt, 
and was eventually resolved by Fireball, wiping out almost all of the troop. They replaced that two days later, and the dungeon master said, no, look, no, we're not going to have you with over 20 creatures. It's just not going to happen. So that, uh, that was another example. But no, uh, some of them were so unbalanced. Uh, I, I, I remember I took a kit of uh, a feral. I think this was also a ranger in kit. Uh, raised by wolves. And there were some of the abilities that were in it were just so good and so strong that it was a no-brainer. One of these days I'll have to track down some of those books and we'll look into those. But I think the only one I have right now is the the Complete Wizards book. But uh, some of them I just remember were were a little bit of trouble. Uh, so, but of course, too, one other thing that's important to remember... Dungeons and Dragons rarely has worried itself all that much until recently about balance in general. If another character is more powerful than you, they're still on your side. So your side got stronger. Now you can have sour grapes where you feel like you can't do as much as another character, and that's kind of natural. I wouldn't blame you for that. But, you know, decrying one thing or another because it's unbalanced really makes you wonder who you're playing against. Are you playing against the, the setting and scenario and the monsters? Or are you just competing with the other players? It's not an argument that I'm saying is one side is right and one side is wrong. I'm not saying that at all. But it's something to think about. All right. So that. Uh, we'll keep going here. Uh, and, yeah, increasing power creep. Yeah, the kits definitely did increase some, some power creep. They really were some of the first things that we encountered that really bloated the, uh, the, the range of options in a point where you would target specific things you cared about, and then the whole idea of builds kind of poured in after that. But it isn't the first time, because as long as Dragon Magazine was out, Dragon had all kinds of experimental rules to add to your game, and not all of those were the most well-considered for game balance either. So, uh, Kits alone and a lot of the second edition stuff was not the exclusive playground of power gamers and, and rules lawyers and the like, so it's important to remember that. If I remember correctly, you could only adopt one kit at any given time to define your character's flavor focus, and you couldn't pick a kit for your race and then a kit for each of your classes in order to stack benefits. Yeah, but just like anything, any game master can overrule that. That's not a carved-in-stone guideline either. And as a matter of fact, I don't even remember if that was a rule or not. I think by general purpose we never did that, but because... Each of those kits was usually so drilled down on one focus, there really wasn't room for expanding into other things. And if you were already getting what you wanted out of that class, why would you multi-class? So, um, yeah, it, it was, it's, it still was an issue. Um, so, yeah. I never had an issue with power creep in second edition, no matter how my players chose to multi-class or whichever kit they chose cool. I do remember plenty of times though in second edition where I felt like a second class character because other people had picked a very strong class and then chose to dominate in whatever area they wanted to dominate, which usually was just raw damage, just smoking entire encounters before the rest of us could really get our blades wet. Um, and that's mostly fine. I mostly play secondary characters anyhow, but there were situations of haves and have-nots. Sometimes it was because of great dice rolls. Sometimes it was because kits and things allowed you to focus to the point where you were completely incompetent in some areas of what your overall class would suggest, but you got so much stronger in certain areas. So that was that was a thing. But I'm glad you never had to worry about that. If your players all got along so well together that they didn't care, weren't competing with each other, that's great. If you found that, yes, I was having some uh, degree of uh, issues with, with handling it all, but it wasn't, it wasn't a balanced thing. It was because, you know, the rules fought against you or uh, you couldn't help but keep giving your players too much stuff and, you know, that power creep nailed you. Well, yeah, that could happen too. All of it could. Second edition, first edition, AD&D didn't have a lot of hand-holding, not a lot of tools to really guide 
game masters into encounter de design, story balance, things like that. It's all an art that you grew to feel as you went along. So, uh, to do. So, I think the reason third edition onward, especially fifth edition, had so much game destroying power creep was because the rules design moved further and further away from having any sort of restrictions, limitations, or even penalties and disadvantages when choosing specific classes and or abilities. Well, I mean, that's part of it. I mean, 4th edition was kind of like a violent lashback against that, balancing everything to the point where it was all one smooth adventuring paste, where everybody was pretty durable, everybody could do just about anything fairly well, um, and everybody had a raft of different abilities that they could employ, just like the guys next to them. Nobody was really wanting for anything because you had almost all the abilities that you really needed to get by. You were fine. Um, but as far as 5th edition goes, there was definitely all elements where they attempted to, to rebalance by bringing the numbers down so that you kept most of the numbers you'll ever have to deal with to f 5 and below. Max strength, 20. It's plus 5. It's a plus 5 to hit, plus 5 to damage. Nice, you'll use that over and over again. Plus 5 to strength saving throws, plus 5 to certain skills like athletics. Wonderful. Absolutely. But that's it. It's, it's a straight plus 5. There's almost no situation where you're going to just give a gimme because your, your stat is so ridiculous. Whereas you could gimmick 3rd edition tremendously to completely obviate some challenges, to... Uh, you know, absolutely uh, shoot your stats through the roof in terms of dealing damage, in terms of uh, your armor class, in terms of your saving throws, in terms whatever you were interested in. There was a kit around, or sorry, not a kit, there were prestige classes around, or magical items to form your build of choice. Um, as far as the restrictions, though, uh, and why... Uh, the game destroying power creep again. We were talking about I, you never having had a problem with with power creep in second edition. Um, I think some people did. That was where you really started to feel it because of especially when they started making changes. And it doesn't sound like uh, this particular person, uh, PGI Films, doesn't sound like you really got to play with the skills and powers books or the combat options books. Those drastically monkeyed around with the mechanics of the game, tinkering with them to create, in some cases, pretty slanted and unfair advantages. Even though there was more playtesting with that, I think, than some of the other stuff, it really did open up the door for completely getting under the hood of a character and tinkering and manipulating so that you could power game and mid-max to your heart's content. Uh, and, and we will be definitely be covering those books because I think they were absolutely essential landmark books in terms of changing the face of how uh, Dungeons and Dragons itself adapted and evolved and grew. Um, but yeah, uh, as far as game destroying and balance and everything like that, that happened all the way back from Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. When you had a wizard, the wizard could break the game. That's how strong magic has almost always been in uh, the original D&D, OG D&D, &D, that still used chainmail as the engine for its rules. Your wizards were basically artillery. And you invested in sometimes lives to keep them alive, but also all of your efforts to keep your spellcasters alive. Clerics, because they'll keep everyone else alive down the road with their healing. Wizards, because they're your artillery. They are the god of war of adventuring. They can direct such firepower that can completely obliterate encounters and completely change the face of the dungeon. Uh, sometimes their powers are, are great enough they can change circumstances to get rid of traps. Um... I can't tell you how many times I had DMs roll their eyes when I would put up a, uh, a wall of stone alongside of a stone wall so that all their cleverness in terms of darts and traps and things like that just didn't matter. Six inches of stone between them, me and the trap, I'm pretty confident I'll be fine. Um, 
wizards just were ultimately very powerful, even while they were very fragile and some game masters would scheme around ways of dealing with powerful wizards, that was your investment. They could break the game. And, uh, you know, at, at, at some point, most of the things that are weaknesses of wizards are there as a game balance thing. So it was really hard to keep a wizard alive long enough for them to get to that point. But when they could, well, there's a reason why people like Morden Kanan, Tensor, Big B, Luke, those are all wizards. All the most important characters of the game of Dungeons and Dragons were wizards. We know that Gary Gygax, the co-creator of the game, had a strong bias towards heroic warrior-type characters like Conan, but even so, he couldn't deny the fact that wizards rule the world if they wanted to. Uh, and, and as such, uh, they were uh, very, very, very much in demand if you're going to have a balanced group, a wizard of some sort was absolutely essential. Just because you would need them for some encounters, you would need them for some challenges that swords alone could not overcome. So, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, I, I think I'm in agreement with pretty much everything PGI Films put down. Uh, I, they had similar experiences to what I did, and, and I think that is... Maybe not a universal. Certainly there are going to be groups that have different uh, outcomes and different experiences. Uh, Dungeons & Dragons was the first game that I actually felt, uh, you know, kind of jealous of other players, you know, rolling a really hot character or... and then just lording over everybody. I never had a paladin in a group. The, it was always too difficult to roll one. Nobody ever got one. But there were plenty of characters who played ridiculously powerful characters, and they were the stars of the show, and the rest of us were just the, the torch holders. Kind of unfortunate. But that was a common experience back in the day. Nowadays, look at how much effort has been put into parody. Oh, wow, standard array characters. Nobody's too strong because everybody has the same stats. People who rolled their characters might look at that and go, that's boring. You'll never have a really awesome character. You'll never have a completely pathetic character, but in fact, with Thunder Summon Game Masters, you never had to worry about that either. Just keep re-rolling until you get a good one. But, I will say this. Uh, I think, for the most part, they, they, they kind of agreed with me. A little elaboration is nice. Um, they more fondly remember kits than I did, which is cool. I've only ever played two characters with kits. Even though I played a lot of 2nd Edition, I played a lot of fairly vanilla character classes. Because, hey, I love wizards. I don't really need a kit to play a wizard. My the, the kit that I played was choosing your school, not being a generalist wizard. So I loved conjurers. If I really wanted to muck with a game, just constantly be conjuring whatever, to, I could bring the game down to a crawl, but oftentimes I knew how to put creatures in places where they would bollocks up the enemy and give our people free reign to do whatever they had to do. I occasionally would play a transmuter, you know, somebody who would who would use various things, and, and oftentimes those characters were invested in buffing my allies, making them more powerful so that they were more effective at what they did. I thought it was a pretty good trade-off for me just standing back and casting a spell. And don't let me, don't get me wrong, most players love being buffed by their allies so that they could be even cooler. When you can realize that you are my weapon. You are how I am controlling this fight. Not me casting a spell and drawing attention. No, you as whatever abomination I've done onto you that you are going to completely wreck their faces. You get to roll the dice. You get to roll the damage. I'm the one who put you there. Or at least I helped, and that's, that's sometimes enough, too. Uh, these are experiences. Uh, different people would obviously have different experiences, but I'm glad that my video had some resonance. And I'm really glad that PGI Films thought enough to leave a detailed comment for me that I could make this video to. If you like the idea of, of having videos made about your insights and your, what you bring to the table in terms of conversation, feel free to follow in their footsteps. Go ahead and put down a comment to a video that you like, 
and uh, or maybe one you didn't like. Explain why you didn't like it. That's fair too. Uh, I don't always. I don't want to dwell in an echo chamber where people just say, "Yeah, you're great. You're 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 you're, you're very insightful. You're awesome." No, challenge me. If I made a mistake, if you didn't have the same experience as I do, by all means, let's discuss that. But I will keep doing video responses to good comments that come in and give me something to work with. And, uh, you know, perhaps in the future, we'll see a lot more. And uh, I think that'll be really cool. But this will go under the conversations file, along with the original video that spawned this comment. And... Uh, you know, hopefully people will come to that and we can we can really have a good discussion about things like that. So thank you one and all. I appreciate you. And I look forward to serving you more in the future by giving you fun videos to, to comment to. So until that next time, my friends, I do hope there is a next time. I really do. But I hope that by then, between now and then, you, yes, you have had a chance to roll some dice, to play some games, to have some fun. But stay safe out there, my friends. Until that next time, farewell.